Well, let's begin part two of our sermon series entitled The Married Life. How many were here last Sunday? How many were blessed? Praise God. Amen. And that's the goal. That's the objective. Again, this is part two of our sermon series, our September sermon series entitled The Married Life. And the goal of our series is to cover and to communicate kingdom keys that will produce and cause a blessed marriage. Kingdom keys, we want to submit to you, kingdom keys that will cause our marriages and our families to be blessed. The word blessed means this, as it pertains to marriage. A blessed marriage is not a normal marriage. A blessed marriage is a great marriage. A blessed marriage is a happy marriage. A blessed marriage is a prosperous marriage. So prosperous, watch this church, such prospering, so prosperous that your marriage will be envied in a healthy sense, causing other families and other married couples to ask, what is the key to your success? Notice key. What's the key that's unlocked? God's empowerment and God's blessing in your life. There are keys, plural keys, that Jesus has given the church whereby we succeed in life. This reality is found in the Gospel of Matthew, the 16th chapter, when Peter, in regards to what Jesus asked him, who do you say that I am? Peter said, you're the Christ, you're the son of the living God. Then Jesus said, upon this reality, the gates of hell shall not prevail, and I give you keys to the kingdom. And by these kingdoms, again, you will not fail, but you will win in every facet of life. Amen. Amen. How many are thankful for keys? You know, as it pertains to a key ring, there are many different keys. And they unlock many different things. The same is true concerning truths from the word of God. When we apply them in our lives, we'll unlock the beauty of God in our lives. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. A blessed marriage. In part one of our series, we covered two kingdom keys to a blessed marriage. Number one, change your mind about marriage. Change your mind about marriage. In other words, allow God's view of marriage to be your view of marriage. Or allow God's mindset about marriage to be your mindset. For if we will allow God's view and God's mindset to be our view and our mindset concerning marriage, then God can manifest his desire in our homes. If we'll allow God to change our mind about marriage, then he can manifest his desire, his desires in our marriage. Can you say amen? amen. Minds, mindsets, perspectives, excuse me, and views. Go ahead, baby. I'm eating a mint and it went down the wrong tube. And here I am his help mate. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. So we talked about changing our mind about marriage because the world has a view on marriage. Your parents, your family have a view on marriage. Everyone has a view on marriage, but there is one view on marriage that is the correct view. And that is God's view. And most of the time, other people's view on marriage, unless you're in godly friendships, godly relationships, a godly family, those views on marriage are wrong. And so when you have that behavior learned, you have to unlearn that behavior. Mm -hmm. So we have to renew our mind and change the way we think about marriage. Amen. That was the first key. Key number two, be quick to repent, be quick to forgive, and be quick to dream and believe God together. In other words, challenges in marriage, challenges, disagreements, and even heated fellowship. That's called fights. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. And even heated fellowship will take place. But in the midst of these moments, when we are equipped with this kingdom key, be quick to repent. Be quick to say, I'm sorry. Be quick to forgive. Be quick to say, hey, it's okay. Let's move forward. And be quick to dream and believe God together. When we're equipped with this key and we apply this key in the midst of those moments, what will take place is resolve, reconciliation, and peace, and we'll experience God's blessing and God's strength to move forward in dreaming and believing God together. Don't give a day to strife. Rather, give a day to dreaming. 
Don't give an hour or two hours or a day after the fight to strife and a cold home, but rather resolve the matter and believe and dream God together. That was key number two. Now today in part two of our series, we will cover key three. Key three. God is the author and architect of marriage. God is the author and architect of marriage. The word author, I'm a definition guy, so I want to give you some definitions. I love definitions. The word author means one who produces, one who creates, one who brings into being. The word author means the beginner or prime mover of anything. The word author means, I love this one, the efficient cause, the originator, the composer, the creator. Many times when we think of the word author, we think of one who composes or writes a book. God is the author of the marital relationship. Now I'll say this, and I hope it makes light. Oprah, as much as I love her, and Dr. Phil, as much as I love him, they're not the author or any talk show host. They're not the author of the marital relationship. It is God's creation. And as an architect, it's God's design. The word architect means one who designs and forms. One versed in the art of building. One who plans or designs buildings and oversees and is responsible for their construction. Now, just for a moment, scripturally, let's turn in our Bibles to Proverbs chapter 18, verse 22. And let's qualify, according to the scripture, that God is the efficient cause or the creator of marriage. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 22 says, Whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing. And all the ladies said, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. And all the men said amen. amen. Praise the Lord, right, men? Whosoever findeth a wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor of the Lord. Now let's go to James chapter 1, verse 17 and couple these verses together to bring us to the conclusion that God is the author of marriage. James chapter 1, verse 17 says, Every good gift... And every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no change, neither shadow of turning. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes from where? It comes from above. And then specifically, it comes down from your Father. And your Father is no respecter of person. Our Father God doesn't see color. Our Father God doesn't see age. Our Father God doesn't see, see stature. What he's looking for is faith. Amen. He's looking for someone to believe him or trust him or take his keys, the keys of his kingdom, and apply them in their lives. Amen. So Proverbs chapter 18, verse 22 says, Whoso findeth a wife finds a good thing. Then when we couple that with James 1, 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above we can clearly see that God is the author of marriage. Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise God. Because God is the author of marriage, and for a moment, let's just think about a composer of a specific book or a writer of a book. Because God is the author of marriage, if you have any questions about marriage, if you have any needs in your marriage, if you have any challenges in your marriage, wouldn't it be wonderful to contact the author? Have you ever read a book by a specific author and read a specific text or a specific paragraph or a specific sentence and you didn't understand what they were saying? Wouldn't it be nice to have their phone number? Wouldn't it be nice, praise God? Wouldn't it be nice? That was perfect timing. <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice to know them on a first name basis? Jay, John Jay, we just reconnected. God, after 20 years, God reconnected us, and he connected us in Jesus. And so now I have your cell number, and you have my cell number, and we know each other on a first-name basis, and we converse throughout the week. 
And when I have a question or if I have something to say to him that would encourage him, and when he has something to say to encourage me or if he has a question, because he knows me on a personal basis, he has access to me. God is the author of your marriage. Your father, God. You have access to him by the Holy Spirit. You have access to him by the blood of Jesus. And whatever your question is, whatever your need is, you can go directly to him and ask him what his desire is. And the awesome thing about God being the author of marriage, but he's also the creator of your spouse. Mm. So not only did he create marriage, he also created your spouse. And so the awesome thing about having the Holy Spirit on the inside of you is when you don't understand something about your spouse, and believe me, there are a lot of times that that's going to happen. Like, what are they thinking? You know, they're different than you. They, they think different. They act different. They walk different. They talk different. They chew different. They breathe different. And some things are different. It's like, that's not good different. That's different. You know, you ever have somebody say, like, you think they're going to give you a compliment, but they say, well, that's different. That's not really a compliment. They're saying that's kind of weird. So <laughs> there's going to be some weird things about, how many in here have some weird things about your spouse? Everybody raise your hand. That's the truth. Come on, be truthful. There's weird things that all of us do. But the Holy Spirit knows everything. And God, the creator of marriage and the creator of your spouse lives on the inside of you. So when you don't know how to handle your spouse or you have a question about your spouse or a question about how to come at them, a question about the way to speak to them, the Holy Spirit on the inside can give you the exact thing to say and the exact way to put something that will just bring peace to a situation or help your spouse. So not only is God the author of marriage, but he's the creator of your spouse. So he can help you when you have a question. You know, a lot of times we want to call somebody, and that's good if you have somebody that's going to give you godly advice, but you don't want to call somebody that's going to demean your spouse or, or, you know, speak death over your marriage, but you can always talk to God and say, God, I don't, I don't know how to handle this right now. I don't like the way this is going. Help me. And he's the creator of your spouse, so he can do that. Amen. Praise God. So marriage was created by God. He's the author of marriage and is only successful when it includes his presence and honors his plan. In your Bibles, let's turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 through 12. Marriage was created by God and is only successful when it includes his presence and honors his plan. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, I want to show you here a marvelous truth concerning God as the author of marriage and our marriage is succeeding because he's included, not excluded. He's included and not excluded. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 through 12. The scripture says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. Again, if two lie together, then they are warm, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. And watch this church. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. So we can see the Spirit of God here emphasizing the importance of relationships. Two is better than one. If one rises against another, one can defeat one, but if, that other, if the one has another person with them, they can withstand. Two together are warm. One alone is not warm. Then the Spirit of God says, a threefold cord is not quickly broken. I believe and I submit to you that the Spirit of God is saying the third person in a relationship, a specific relationship that we're discussing, our marriage relationship, is Jesus. She represents a strand. I represents, represent a strand. And because God is the cause and the creator of marriage, he is the third strand. And marriage succeeds 
when he's included, not excluded. I want to submit this thought to you. This is the way the Holy Spirit gave it to me. Imagine someone birthing something, creating something, causing something to begin, and then the moment it begins, they're excluded from the picture. Many times, many times in marriage, many times because we don't know, many times in marriage, the author of the marriage is never included in the marriage. And that marriage stands by two strands alone. And when the pressures of life come, and the pressures of, of situations come, pressures come for one reason, to bust, to break, to disconnect. Then those two strands without the third strand is easily broken. But when a marriage between a husband and a wife includes the creator, involves the creator, marriage was never designed to exclude God. Marriage was designed to maintain and to keep the creator in it. And when that third strand is intertwined in the fabric of your family and your marriage, the same pressures that we all face, the same crisis of life that we all face, the same midnight hour that we all face, when that comes, instead of the pressure busting us, breaking us, separating us, it cannot stop us. Because God, he makes the difference. The creator makes the difference. And that pressure cannot break that threefold cord. Praise the Lord. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. It can't, it won't, it can't stop that reality of those three cords. Praise the Lord. So, God is the author of marriage. Amen? God is the creator of marriage. And marriage is only successful when he's intertwined in the fabric of it. Praise the Lord. Amen. So let's talk about the practic practical side of that. I want to talk about the practical side by asking you a question. So I've given us information. Many of us are, we're aware of these, these things. But let's talk about it practically. When pressure comes, I want to ask you this question. Who do you turn to? When pressure comes against your marriage, who do you look to? When challenges in the midnight hour comes to your life, who do you turn to? Do you turn to the internet? Do you turn to a credit card? Internally, do you turn to fear or worry? Or do you turn to the creator? Can you say amen? amen. Now, of course, all of us, we can answer that question. I've turned to the wrong things, but because God is the creator, the question is to our lives, why would I turn to that? It's not going to help anything. It's not going to change anything. But God who designed marriage, if I turn to him first, who do I look to first when the challenges of life come against my family? The answer to that question will answer this. God is intertwined in the fabric of my marriage. Praise the Lord. Amen? amen. Now, can you give me an amen there? Can you see that? Amen. I hope that helps because that question is key. We could put it this way. Many times we know God, but the question is, do we trust God? Remember, we began, even before we got into today's message, belief is what initiates God's manifestation in our life. Many of us, all of us, we know God, but when the challenges of life, the crisis of life come and present themselves, will we trust God? And I want to answer that question for us because I'm not trying to be negative. I'm just trying to get us to think. The answer to that question is we will turn to God. We will trust Jesus. And when we trust Jesus, that storm and that challenge will pass and we'll remain standing and we'll be a witness for him in our generation. Amen? Amen. Praise God. One last thing I want to say right here, and then I'll turn it over to you. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27. He said, he that hears my word and applies it is a wise person. And the storms of life will come to that person. 
the winds, the rains, the floods will come, come against that person and beat upon their house. But because they've built their life upon the rock, then that challenge, it's only temporary, is going to pass. And that marriage will stand. The way the Holy Spirit put it to me, he said this to me in study. He said, your marriage can be on the verge or, or on the rocks. Is that right? Your marriage can be on the rocks or your marriage can be built on the rock. Hallelujah. Our marriage can be on the rocks, on the verge of going the wrong way, or we can make the choice that whatever Jesus says, I'm simply going to say, yes, sir. And I'm going to build my marriage and my family upon the rock. And when those pressures come, they don't stand a chance. Amen? Yeah, so when you have a problem with your spouse, when you have a problem, most of the time you, your nagging and your complaining is not going to change that. How many women in here think that, well, if I just tell my husband what I think, that's going to change his mind? We're all guilty of that. If I just tell him, he hasn't heard it this way. Let me go in here. Let me walk into the living room and tell him this. You know, that, like, that's going to change everything. Like, oh, your bad attitude towards your husband is going to change anything. It's going to make it worse. So when a situation happens, when, and I'm growing in this, and we're all growing in this, when a problem happens, when, when they do something that to directly or indirectly hurt you, you turn to God. He's the only one that can really change it. Because you can try in your own mind, and it might change for a week, but you, if you want a real change, if you want a heart change, you have to go to God. Because he's the only one that can change a heart. He's the only one that can convict someone to do something different. He's the only one that can really transform. So if you want permanent, lasting change in your marriage, you have to turn to God. And I know this sounds like, Simple and it sounds crazy, but when you're in that pressure, when you're in that moment, that's really the last thing that you want to do is go pray. Well, they just did something to hurt you or they said something that makes you mad. Well, I just feel like going and praying right now. That's really not your reaction to something that happens. You want to either tell them off, tell somebody about what they did. You want to slam a door so they can hear you. You want to drive off real fast so they can hear you drive off. You want to do everything but pray. <laughs> so in those moments, you've got to train yourself to go and say, you know what? If I really want change, God's the only one that can do it. And we can all grow in that. Amen. Praise God. Now let's talk about God as the architect of marriage. Architect. We define the word architect. Architect is the one who designs. Architect is the one who is uh, versed in the art of building and is responsible for the construction of a building. God is the architect of our marriages. That simply means this. He knows how to build our families. He knows how to construct our marriage. So again, he's the author and he's involved and intertwined in the fabric of our marriage, but then he wants our marriage to be constructed. He wants our marriage to grow. He wants our marriage to be blessed. And so he's the architect. Now, the awesome thing about him being the architect is he's the designer, but he's not the builder per se. The architect, I have just, just, just minimal experience uh, with building a building. When I graduated from Rama Bible School and became a, a part of my dad's staff in that season, he built a building. And he purchased a building that the outside was done, but the inside was just a, a concrete slab. It was called a shale for a building. And so... The goal was to make that shell, that building that was done on the outside, on the inside of church. And I learned in that moment that the first thing that we had to do was to hire an architect. We couldn't go in immediately. Although we owned it, we couldn't go in and start building. We had to have an architect. And his name was Peter Snyder. He pulled up to the parking lot. My dad cast the vision. My dad said, this is where we want this. This is where we want this. And submitted it to the architect. 
Then the architect created plans, page after page, blueprints. And this page represented this room, and this page represented another room, and this page represented what we were going to do here with the plumbing and the electri electrical and all the different facets of a building. And once those blueprints were finished, because he had the license, he was able to stamp those blueprints and then take them to the city. Then the city, the city authorized, the city oversaw, the city made sure everything was code. And so that building would be built property, properly and there would be longevity to the facility. And so they stamped, they stamped those blueprints. Once those blueprints were stamped, we all rejoiced. That means we can finally build. And we began to do so. And we had to follow the blueprints. Now, this is my point in sharing all that. Peter Snyder did not come to the church or come to that building and do one thing to build it. Peter Snyder said, everything's code, everything's authorized. I'm not the builder, now you build it. Now this is a very important facet in the Christian walk because a lot of times, follow me here, and I'm doing my best to communicate this, a lot of times in Christianity, we put all the responsibility on God. When God, as your Father, has given you the victory through Jesus Christ, has, has, has forgiven you through Jesus Christ, has, has made you brand new through Jesus Christ, there's a finished work, but as an architect, he says now, here are the blueprints, now you build it. You're going to build it, right? No. I'm going to build it through you. You're going to come down here and do it, right? No. I've given you my spirit. I've given you my word. I've given you the blood. I've given you everything you need. I've given you everything you need. It's finished. But now apply what I've done for you and build your marriage. So God has done everything so we can build our marriage. So Peter Snyder never grabbed a hammer and put one nail into a, into a stud. Peter Snyder never came down and put a, put a, put a um, he never did any mud or drywall or anything. He never wired any electricity. That was all subbed out to us. Can you say amen one more time? God's going to use you and I to build our homes and to build our marriages. But he's equipped us to do it. Praise the Lord. Amen. So you can't say, God, why? You can't say, God, why is it? That's a good question. <laughs> he's going to say, hey, have you not read? Pastor Mark says this, if, if, they, if, they run at, if they run after you, just run out in front of them, and it'll look like it's a parade. <laughs> you follow me with that statement? There's a part we play, church. Jesus, in his earthly ministry, he said, have you not read many times? What he's doing, he's not being mean. He's trying to get you to the answer. He's trying to get you to the change. He's trying to get you, hey, there's a part you play. Now I'll play my part, but if you play your part, then it's a win-win. The architect's not going to build the building. The builder's going to build the building. But the architect will empower you to build right and build according to code. Therefore, your marriage will have longevity. It will stand the test of time. Praise God. So how many went into marriage planning to fail? Nobody? 
You never go into marriage planning to fail, right? Like, I'm going to get married, and we're going to be the worst at it. <laughs> yeah. We're going to be the worst wife and the worst husband. We, none of us go into marriage planning to fail. But have you heard of the phrase that goes like this? Those who fail to plan, what? Plan to fail. You know, a lot of times when people come to us and they're getting married, they put more energy into the ceremony than the actual marriage part. They don't do any preparation time of getting their relationship on the right track. They don't do any type of like, you know, what's it, what's it like? What, what do I need to do to be a wife? What do I need to do? To, they, don't do any, they don't put any work, but they put a ton of work into the ceremony. But if God is the architect of marriage and we're the builders, we have a part to play, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to plan and we are going to succeed because of the plan. All right, so what does the God's word say about marriage? Let's go to Ephesians chapter 5 and I'm going to read verses 20 through 33. And I'm going to read it out of the Passion Translation. And we all know these are like the famous marriage scriptures like wives and husbands and they're used in all kinds of contexts in the right and wrong way. But let's read them and let's look at them and let's see what they mean. All right, Ephesians chapter 5 verse 20 says, always give thanks to the Father God for every person he brings into your life in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And out of reverence for Christ, be supportive of each other in love. For wives, this means to be devoted to your husbands like like you are tenderly devoted to our Lord. And for the husband provides leadership for the wife, just as Christ provides leadership for his church and the Savior and the reviver of his body. In the same way the church is devoted to Christ, let wives be devoted to their husbands. And to husbands, you are to demonstrate love for your wives with the same tender devotion that Christ demonstrated to us, his bride. For he died for us, sacrificing himself to make us holy and pure, cleansing us through the showering of pure water of the word. And all that he does is, is designed to make us mature, a mature church for his pleasure until we become the source of praise to him. All right, so first of all, let's look at verse 22 again. Let's just stop there for a minute. And let's, I'm going to talk about what wives should do, and he's going to talk about what husbands should do, because <laughs> you don't want me to talk about what a husband should do, right? Like, you want him to talk about that. <laughs> How many wives can tell a husband what they should do? Yeah, we feel like we know. We, we know. We got it down. You should. You should. You should. You should. But that's not the way it's going to go this morning. I'm going to say what the, what the Bible says the wife to do, and he's going to do the husband. All right, so let's read this again. For what, so the first thing it says in verse 21, and out of reverence for Christ, be supportive of each other in love. So that's talking about being supportive to everybody in love. That's talking about giving thanks to all people, everybody that's in your life. You support them, and you give thanks for them in love. That's for everybody. But right here it says, for wives, what does that mean? For wives, this means you are tenderly devoted to your husbands, like you're tenderly devoted to the Lord. And so, this is God's design. We want to know how to build our marriage. This is where we start. Yes. Because this is where God gives the definition of what a wife should do. Yes. So, this is very important for us to know. So, Let's see what respect means. Respect means a feeling of deep admiration for someone. How many feel that way about their husbands? A feeling of deep admiration. I know I do. I don't always show that I do, but I know that I do. But this is what the Bible is telling me to do. Have a feeling of deep admiration for my husband. What does that mean? Thinking he's great. Thinking, you know, thinking on the good things that he does. He does do this. He helps out with, he helps out at home. He loves the kids. He's a provider. He goes to work. You know, he takes care of all these things. I admire that about my husband. Now, let's see what, I like, I like the word devotion that the Passion Translation has here. Devotion means this. It means to love. It means love, loyalty, and enthusiasm for a person enthusiasm for a person. That means you get excited when they come home, not, oh, here we go. <sighs> you see a phone call, oh my goodness. 
Or like my daughter, she says, oh, my goodness, now. She says, oh, my goodness. So you see the phone call, and you're like, oh, not again. But you're not supposed to have that feeling. Why? We're supposed to have a feeling of admiration and enthusiasm, you know, like, like you want to be around that person, not you're trying to get rid of that person. You want to be around that person. You want them to do things with you. You want them to spend time with you. you want, you are, you're excited to talk to them, to do things with them, to be enthusiastic about our husbands. Now, many times <laughs> these verses can be taken wrong where, you know, in the King James it says, wives, submit. And that is true. There is a place for that. But a lot of times what will happen is a man will say, woman, you're supposed to submit to me. So get in there and cook me a burger. (laughs) Now, that's going to have the opposite effect, right? That's going to have the opposite effect. Now I'm definitely not going to submit to you, and I'm definitely not going to cook you a burger. (laughs) So (laughs) there is a part. That, but that's not necessarily what the Bible means when it says submit. It means this, that prefer him to say, you know what? I'm going to let him take a godly leadership. And when he makes a decision, I can voice my opinion. I can, we are equals in this. We submit one to another. But it means this. If he chooses to go against the way that I think something should go when I've given him my opinion, that's okay. Ladies are looking at me. Unless it's immoral. Yeah, unless it's immoral. We all know that. Like, unless it's immoral or he's doing something wrong. But if, if it's a decision that you're making, you're talking to one another, and he, you give him your opinion, and he doesn't necessarily see it the same way as you, and he decides, because somebody's got to make the call, right? Like, somebody's got to pull the trigger. Somebody's got to make the decision. And if he chooses to go a separate way than you, or, or something a little bit different than what you thought should go, that doesn't mean that you just, well, I know, well, we'll see what happens, but it's going to be awful. I already know the outcome of this. Remember what happened last time you didn't listen to me? That is not respect and devotion. That is, I know what's up. And most of the time, ladies, we do know what's up. But to, to show respect for our husbands, that means you don't have to see everything the way I see it, but I'm going to support you. And even if you choose to go a different route than the way I see it, I'm going to pray about it. Because see, the thing about the Holy Spirit is he's our best friend. Ladies, he's our best friend. And if we think that our husbands are, you know, as long as it's not immoral or wrong or go against God's word and they're making a choice that you don't think is necessarily the smartest, but they want to make it anyway, you know what you can do is you can go to God and say, God, I see disaster ahead. I see a train wreck coming. Intervene now, Holy Spirit. No, we can go to God and say, you know what? And sometimes he'll say, you know what? You're wrong about that. Your husband's right. But if your husband's wrong, (laughs) the Holy Spirit can work in him. And he can talk a lot better than you can. And your husband can receive a lot better from him than he can from you. And that's the truth. So that's, that's being respectful. That's letting him be the head of the house, the leader. So... Another thing we are to do is we're supposed to be his support system, his friend. You know, men are bombarded with a lot of things. You know, they have to provide. They have, and and there's a lot of temptation in the world targeting men. That's rough. You know, when there's constantly something in front of you trying to, trying to get your attention to go the wrong way and the opposite way that God has, that's tough. So us as wives, we're, we're to be a support system. Us as wives, we're supposed to lift up our husband, to help our husbands. When someone calls him a name, when someone says he's not, he's not good enough, or when someone says, someone says something bad about him or thinks he can't do something, you're supposed to be there and say, you know what, you can do it. And you're supposed to be there for him and support him and stand by him and help him to be his helper. That's why we were created, to be his helper. 
in whatever that is. And the Holy Spirit can help you. He can show you how to be your husband's helper. Amen. So it's not about him never letting you speak. It's not about him overriding everything you think. It's not about him making all the calls, making all the choices. It's about working together and doing it the way that God has told us to do it, to respect, to honor, to love, to be devoted, to show him that you care, to be behind him, to support him. You know, have you ever heard the phrase, behind every successful man is a good woman? I believe that that's true because if a husband has a support system at home, has someone constantly pushing him to be better, to do better, to help him, to say, you know what, let's do this, to, to let the Holy Spirit lead her and guide her and show, show him what to do, you could be a power team. You could be a power couple. Instead of working against each other, work together with your children. Work together in your decisions. Work together. Be a support system for one another. Now, I heard this on a, a movie, and it's a pretty funny, and, it's, and uh, it was a mother giving her daughter advice, and she said, you know, the man is the head, but the woman is the neck. And that's not necessarily in the Bible. But what I got out of that is this. The head has to have something to support it, to make the right calls, to move in the right way. And us as women, we can do that. Amen. We can help our husbands be better. We can support them. We can love them. We don't have to constantly nag them and tell them everything they're doing wrong and da 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 and say, oh, you shouldn't order this at the food. Why did you order that food? Why did you do this? Why did you do that? Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? You know, you got to do this, 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 and this. That can get on somebody's nerves. I got on my own nerves just right then. <laughs> to be a constant nagger, you get on somebody's nerves. So don't do that. And I've got to talk to myself on this too. Be a supporter. Be a helper. Be an encourager. Be a say, we can do this. Let's do this. Let's, let's, let's make this decision. Let's, let's move forward. Yes, let's, yes, let's, yes. Let's, let's purchase a home. Let's have children. Let's, let's do all that God has told us to do, and let's do it together. Let's work together. Let's yes. want to be around each other. I want to be around my husband. I want to do things with him. You know, be an encourager. Build your husband up. Build your husband up by helping him, and build your husband up through prayer. Praise God. Amen. The greatest advantage that a marriage can have is agreement. Work together. That's what I'm hearing you say. Work together. Pull together. Head in the same direction. Support one another. Amen. Gentlemen, as we close here, I want to give you our side according to Ephesians chapter 5, verses 20 through 33. Um, and this is our side concerning building. Like my wife said, these verses of Scripture give us the code, give us the materials to build our marriage, give us the responsibilities, her responsibility, my responsibility. And when I play my part and she plays her part, then the marriage will be built according to the architect's plans. Amen? Gentlemen, this is our side. Husbands, this is our side. This is what I see. I submit to you. Husbands, God has instructed you and I to build our marriages in the same way, and you can say amen to this, in the same way Jesus builds his church. How many, yeah, we just said, how many, one more time can say amen that Jesus builds his church. And we understand that we're his bride. Romans chapter seven, verse four says that we're married to Jesus. Every one of us in this room, Jesus is our husband. We're his church, we're his body, we're his bride. And all he does is build us. All he does is lift us up. All he does is cause us to edify and make progress. So in the same way Jesus builds his church, we've been given the responsibility to build our homes. In the same way Jesus takes care of his body, his church, God has designed that the husband take care of, provide for, encourage, help, invest in, and bring strength to his wife. The common thing that I saw in these verses as I studied it was this word. This was the word that came to my heart, priority, priority. In other words, for us to build our wives,
for us to build our homes in a godly manner, our wives must become the priority. Can I get an amen from the wives? The word priority means this, precedence in place and precedence in rank. First in place, first in rank. Now, of course, Jesus is always first. He's the third cord of your threefold cord that won't be quickly broken. He's the head of your union. He's the head of your marriage. But after that, the next priority that takes first place in the husband's life is the wife. Too many times, too many times, our wives take second place, third place, fourth place, fifth place. It's a common ditch for any marriage. It's a common ditch that I believe the enemy draws a husband towards, that my wife becomes familiar, my wife becomes common. She's always gonna be there, and that's true. And therefore, she becomes ordinary, or we could use the word common or disvalued. And when that happens, she's not the priority, but she has to become the priority. Anything, gentlemen, think about it this way. This is the way the Lord put it to me. He said, anything in your life, Michael, that has excelled, that has made progress, that has increased, that has grown, you made it a priority. Think about that for a minute, gentlemen. Anything in your life that has succeeded, anything in your life that's made progress, anything in your life that has excelled, it, it, it excelled, it grew, it was grown, it built, it, it made progress because it was the priority. The Holy Spirit, gentlemen, is saying to us right now, here's the key. He's putting a key in our hands and he's saying, Michael, specifically to me, Nicole has to become the priority. Not the church, not the children, not the job, not this, not that, not this, not that, not this. She has to become the priority in the same way, Michael, you're my priority. You're Jesus' priority. Husbands, for us to win in our marriage, for us to, to build our marriages according to the architect's design, they have to become first. Three keys or three practical ways to do that. This is what I got out of study. Number one, pursue her. Pursue her. For me, I've got to go back to when I courted her before I asked her to marry her. I wanted to be around her all the time. I got five speeding tickets <laughs> in that season of my life. Any window I had, I sped to Coleman, Alabama. Pursue her. In pursuing her, she'll receive quality time. In pursuing her, she will receive face-to-face -face time. In pursuing her, her emotional needs will be met. The question is to the men right now, to myself, am I pursuing my wife? Am I doing what I did for her to say yes to will you marry me? Am I still doing that? Because she said yes because I was all I was I was all in. I was I want to be there. But over time things can become ordinary and normal. So the Lord is saying this, gentlemen, change. And change begins with acknowledgement. You can't change anything. We can't change anything in our lives until we acknowledge it. But when we acknowledge it, then the process of change can, can, can begin. Can you say amen? The second thing, the second thing that demonstrates making our wife's priority is prefer your wife. Prefer your wife. I learned this from my dad. 
Before my dad, and my dad's a preacher, before my dad bought a suit, Bonnie Linden had a, had a dress. Before my dad bought a new car, and all he would buy was Astro Vans. I don't know why. That's just, praise the Lord. Glory. Another Astro Van, Dad, please. <laughs> Especially when you get older, you're thinking, man, I got to get dropped off in that. And I know you could have bought an SUV. Praise the Lord. All right. I saw my dad prefer my, my mom. He lived selfless. Now, the awesome thing about having that, that, that mindset, seeing it, it's instilled in me. It's easy for me to do that one. Number three, prefer your wife. That simply means, before I go to number three, it means meet her needs before yours. Your needs are important, but her needs are more important. She should have the makeup. She should have all the extra money. Make sure, take care of her. Really, why? She represents you. If she looks good, you, I know that sounds self, but if she looks good, she represents you. Jesus has that understanding. If my bride's taken care of, I want to present to myself a bride without spot, without wrinkle. I want to present a mature, I want to wash my bride. I want to take care of her. You go get your nails done. Pamper, prefer. Gentlemen, if we do that, you know what we're doing? We're making it easy, easy for them to follow us in leadership. They'll want to hook up with that. They'll want to support that. They'll want to... They know your heart. Number two, prefer. Can you say amen? amen? The last one, serve your wife. Serve your wife. This is what I got out of this statement. The responsibility of marriage are a team effort. So it's not just her job to do all the cleaning. It's not her job just to do all the dishwashing. It's a team effort. And gentlemen, when we work our 10 hour, our eight hour, our 12 hour day, we can't just come home and there's a temptation just to sit on the couch and we need to unwind. And we can't as much as I want to. After an eight hour day, 10 hour day, she's already had an eight hour day too. We can't just come home and I've been guilty of it and come home and just, hey, I need a, And we do need a break. But that's not the time to take the break. We've got to come home and support. We've got to come home and serve. We've got to mow your lawn. Amen? Now, if she wants to mow the lawn, some ladies like to mow the lawn. Let her mow the lawn. But mow the lawn. Take care of the landscape. Wash the dishes. She did all the cooking. You wash the dishes. Help with the children. Go the extra mile. She's watched the kids all day. It's my turn. Honey, you take a break. And then once we get the kids down around 7, 7.30, we'll take a break together. Praise the Lord. Our wives have to become the priority in the same way you're the priority of Jesus. He builds us. He develops us. He constructs us because we're the apple of his eye. If we maintain that perspective of our wives, it'll be natural Date nights, romance, intimacy. Those things will take on a, a natural rhythm in our lives. Praise the Lord. So I hear the word priority. What's priori priority? First in place, first in rank. After Jesus, she's first place. I heard a pastor say it like this and we close. Your main congregation is not the congregation. Your main congregation is your wife. Praise God. Amen.